up front if you want to be at the head of the class. <laughs> Two seats? Okay. Do I do I just need to tell you when to advance? Yeah, I can't get the remote to do page up and down. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. But I can put it for you. You have a laser pointer if you need one. Oh, that's all right, thanks. That's okay. They said they're hecklers, so I think that's probably a good sign. <laughs> So my name is Randy Samuelson Brown. Um, I'm originally from Golden, Colorado. I live in Denver now. Um, this is my book, The Beaten Territory. Um, let's see, it's backed by History Colorado. I'm starting to do a lot of lectures for them in Denver. It was a Molly Brown House Book Club selection. It's a tattered cover staff pick. And I'm really, really fortunate. I was talking to one gentleman back there in the sea of people. Um, when I started writing the book, I don't know that I thought people would be interested in prostitutes of prostitution. And <laughs> maybe I was a little naive. Um, <laughs> what happened was, um, the main character in this book is what I would call a second-rate Denver madam, but she was a smart one. She was smart enough to keep her name out of the newspapers as much as possible. And how I even heard about her is a friend of mine named Chris Murphy she was driving me over one of the viaducts that really aren't there anymore, and she's like, yeah, there's bad blood in my family. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, yeah, my dad's great aunt was a second-rate madam, and her niece was hooking for her, and things went really bad. And I remember I didn't care about the concert we were going to anymore. I wanted to hear about those people. And <laughs> so she would tell me what she knew, and then I'm like, yeah, I think I'm going to write a book on that. And then she kind of got this really horrified expression. And then she said, she's like, no, 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 no. You can't write a book until Aunt Francie and somebody else dies. <laughs> so I wait for these poor people to pass on. And I'm like, great. <laughs> you hate to say that, but I'm like, let's talk. And they're like, we don't know anything. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, you guys. So anyhow, I started doing research, tremendously hard to do research on prostitutes. They would change their names. They would change their age. They would change their location. So you kind of get a good line on somebody, and all of a sudden, they disappear. And then they crop up in some place else. And you're like, some of it sounds like this other lady, but you have no way of proving it. So it's just pretty wild. So I've got a couple of things to pass around. This is a picture of a Denver in brothel interior. So they're wearing what I would call Lance of Austria brothel gowns. So this was another problem when I was writing because I wanted them to look like Miss Kitty and have plumes and silks. <laughs> that wasn't really what was happening. A little bit later on, they would have some of these novelty pictures that they would give to clients to build up business. And then we have the phenomenon of brothel tokens. And what these are is the madams didn't trust the girls to handle the money themselves for obvious reasons. So the gentleman would make the arrangement with what girl he was going to go with, how much he was going to pay. She would give um, him a brothel token after he gave her the money. And then he would give this to the prostitute for the transaction and then after in the early hours of the morning or the next day they would all settle up. So I'll just start passing some of these around. Alright. So basically we're talking mainly about Denver but here we go. So the red light district, um, newspapers are great. They kind of had what we would call yellow journalism. And one of the monikers they used for our red light district was called Hell Swift Alley. It's great. <laughs> Next. <laughs> this is what Denver looked like in 1984. I think I'm a little taller than this. It looks radically different today. So when people finally got here, they weren't really impressed. And this is actually probably this is after the flood and they started building uh, brick buildings, so they thought this was pretty good. So what I really, um, my, my theory on Colorado history is well-adjusted people did not come out here. Okay? If everything was fine at home and fine on the East Coast, they were not coming here. 
here. We got the people who are desperate, we got people who wanted easy money, and we got people who are looking for adventure. And then a few nice people wandered in too, but of course I overlooked those because they just, you know, they built schools. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> so if you wonder, if you want to think about why Denver in Colorado was the way it was, um, the first census was taken in 1860. Out of 32,654 people, 31,077 were men. <laughs> so that's a ratio of 20 to 1. And then age 20 to 30 out of that subset were 17,604 to 520 females. You can see the problem. The ratio is 34 to 1. And then age 30 to 40, 10,511 to 278 women. women. That's a ratio of 38 to 1. So, what do men, young men do without restraint? <laughs> oh yeah, um, well, they gamble. They drink too much. They might work some, but you know, nobody's telling them to work. No one's telling them get up and go do something. So they kind of were left to their own device, devices. And if you think women were a stabilizing influence, some of them were, but not the ones we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so Denver, Colorado has always been a hard drinking state. It's always had drugs. Always had drugs. Um, probably most of the wild west behavior stemmed from alcohol, in my opinion. Um, taking your drugs or smoking opium was considered as different from heavy drinking. So heavy drinking was just fine, okay? Nobody worried about it. Um, smoking opium was considered deviant, mainly because it came from Chinese um, immigrants. And laudanum was considered medicinal. So laudanum features heavily in my book. Anyhow, next please. Drugs of choice, laudanum, morphine, opium, marijuana, spelled a little bit different, and cocaine. This was in all these types of medicines. It was available over the counter. Um, it, and it was, it was not expensive. Next. Here's just what a saloon looked like in Morrison. These are cowboys. Um, the floor is kind of messy, you know, they look great. So just wanted to show you the interior. Because these are, if you were a woman of the night, these would be your customers, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so social drinking on the frontier. So beer was most popular by 1890 when we had um, a fair number of German immigrants come across who actually knew how to make beer, so that was great. But whiskey was more easily transportable. Um, shipment started in early April and finished up in November. On the last day of November 1864, a wagon carrying 1,600 barrels of whiskey arrived in Denver to last the winter. From what I can tell, there were um, 3,500 inhabitants. That's a lot of whiskey. I uh, September 5th. September 5th, 1887, uh, there were complaints in Black Hills about women in the dance halls with black eyes um, and bruises, and there's really no reason to think Denver was any different. <laughs> so what are you drinking, with, whoops, sorry, what are you drinking when you order whiskey um, in the frontier? It would cost you 25 cents, which sounds like a bargain, but 25 cents then is about $7 today. So you were getting a shot of whiskey that was watered down, probably with tea or tobacco juice. Um, bogus whiskey was made with raw ethyl alcohol, and added to it was tobacco juice, gunpowder, prune juice, tree bark, molasses, sagebrush, strychnine, turpentine, creosote, or rattlesnake heads. People didn't really feel very good the next morning, and they usually didn't know what was happening too much around them that night. So, just so you know. So, old Western names for liquor kind of give you an idea what was going on. Scamper juice, face burner, bottle of courage, bug juice, calabocus, clinch mountain, coffin varnish, corn juice, cowboy cocktail, Deadshot, Dynamite, Family Disturbance, <laughs> Fire, Water, 40 Rod, and the list goes on. <laughs> Here's just some interiors of Frontier Saloons. Um, I took these at South Park City and Fair Play, which is actually worth going to see if you are in the neighborhood. It's a really good collection of buildings. 
So this is a stage photo of a drunk on 17th Street in Denver. But see the thing he's standing in front of? That is a drunk closet tank. So they were so many drunk people that they didn't really want to fill up the jails with them and they were hard to get to the jails because they were drunk. So they'd shut them in these things. So there was no heating in the winter, there was no water in the summer, so we figured people probably died in these things if the beat cup changed shifts and they didn't know somebody was in there. You know, um, but we don't know. There aren't really any records for that. So that's, there you go. This could happen to you. <laughs> Patent drugs and ingredients. Um, many medicines contain from 17 to 44 percent alcohol. Godfrey's cordial Feely's pneumatic mixture had morphine in it. Laudanum is a derivative of opium, often mixed with spirits like whiskey or wine. They give it to women for cramps. Women would give them to children for teething. Um, highly addictive stuff. Uh, morphine and glycerin cured sore throats. Morphine and cocaine cured nasal drip and hay fever. And opium was good for insomnia. <laughs> so, if you think these women were attractive and looked like Miss Kitty, I got some pictures for you. <laughs> The woman at the top there, that's Lou Bunch out of Central City. She was originally from Sweden. She ended up going straight later on in life, but I think she weighed about 300 pounds. Um, and the bed races in Central City, Lou Bunch days, named after her. Maddie Silks, one of our most famous Denver madams. And Jenny Rogers, um, probably one of the prettiest madams, tried to keep her name out of the um, newspaper as well, but she like Maddie, like um, younger guys who spent their money and like racing horses. A really bad combination sometimes. So. And here's some of the girls who work for them. So this is Laura Bullion. Um, she was a girlfriend of one of the um, Butch Cassidy's outlaw bunch, one of the men there. That's a mugshot. She robbed a stage or a bank, I don't know. Um, the one in the middle, I think that's a stage photograph of a woman who is contemplating the wreckage of her life with a hangover. <laughs> and then this lady at the top, and that's off of eBay. Um, you can buy pictures of prostitutes that are authentic, but they usually go for about $250 to $500, wildly expensive. But yeah, advertising the goods. So. <laughs> this is a Colorado actress. That is what it says um, in the records. Now, when any woman is sitting there like that with her skirt hiked up over her knees in those years, she's not proper. You can also see the edge of a brothel gown right there, so you kind of know this is one of those cabin-type joints. <laughs> okay, so what do you call prostitutes in those years? Harridan, nymph du pas, self, fallen woman, hooker, shady lady, soiled duck, Lady of the Lamplight, that is another newspaper one, because I cannot imagine guys going, hey, Ed, look, there's a Lady of the Lamplight. You know, that is not what they're going to say. But, you know, it's just such a great term, I had to use it. Hussey, Cyprian, Dunny Mundane, Lady of Elfane, Lady of the Line, or Bod. So, not exactly nice, but they did the trick. So how much did it pay, or how much did it cost? It depends on your perspective as to which side of the transaction you're on. Um, so probably this should be in reverse order. There was a strict hierarchy for among the, the women. Parlor houses charged the most. They would be about fifty to five to fifty dollars at the best places. Um, Note that the Homestead House in Cripple Creek still claims to this day that they got $250 in assignation. I don't believe them. I mean, that would have been like the price of a, you know, a plat of land. I mean, nobody's going to do that. But regardless, it's not worth arguing with the people working there. Um, so that's a lot. Uh, brothel ladies got about um, one dollar to ten dollars. Crip girls got twenty-five cents to seven or to one dollar, and one dollar in eighteen ninety is equivalent of twenty-four forty-one in twenty eighteen. What's the difference between a girl and a brothel? The money and the age. So what happened is you might start off if 
if you're fresh out of the farm and you were nice and, or you just decided you really wanted this lovely dresses or whatever you're doing, you could make it into a parlor house if you were conversant, attractive, well-dressed. But time has a way of playing havoc with everybody. And as you became known around town, it was kind of like you were like used meat. I think they used that term a lot. So that's when they started changing their names and kind of changing locations. So you could be used meat in Denver, but if you went up to Central City, you were now fresh meat with a new name and a new age. But if you couldn't really, um, if people didn't want to hire you, you would start this downward progression. So then the next step down would be the brothel house. So that was kind of middle, you know. It was homely, but um, not lavish. Crib girls are when you have, there's even levels of crib girls. There's the better crib girls who have two rooms and the poorer crib girls who have one room. And they would leave the windows open so men could see what was going on as free advertising. So they were pretty far gone on drugs and alcohol. So this is what Market Street in Denver looked like in, oh gosh, probably 18, late 1880s. You can see that there's a couple girls soliciting. They used to like grab men's hat as they would walk by. But you know, to be honest with you, between the streets of 18th and 22nd along Market Street, any guy walking on the sidewalk knew that it was all inhabited by prostitutes. Unless he was a tourist who really failed every warning sign along the way. So, um, you know, if they got their hat thrown in, they were still probably court in trouble. How many customers a day? Um, you know, there are wild, wild estimates out there. I think Joanne West Dodds um, does a, has a great book. Um, it's, hard, it's out of print now, but it's really good. She believes about four to ten transactions per day. Um, the house usually took half of the proceeds. Um, some houses took a cut of the tips if the girl was honest enough to say, I got a tip. I think people might have started out honest in the business, but as they kind of got jaded and, you know, as time went on, they kind of got street smart, shall we say. Um, girls often charged their clothes on the madam's account, so they never had to pay. They would just go into department stores and put it, like, you know, on the madam's account, which is all great and good, but the madam would charge the girl interest. And so all these things would really transpire to keep these girls tied to a house until the madam didn't want them anymore. They weren't earning enough. And then I think they would just forgive the debt and just like kick them on out. So um, girls would charge rent, board, and laundry costs in the brothels. Cribs, weekly rent, no board or laundry. The cribs were really pretty dicey. Next. So this is a pretty famous picture of Denver prostitutes. It makes me a little bit sad. Because here are some girls, and they've got wild, fabulous hats on. They're all dressed up. They're getting their picture taken. That was a big deal in those days. And they're with um, what we would call macro or cadets. They're not pimps. They're procurers. So they would like lure these girls into a life of ill fame. But here they are, and the girls are pouring out drinks. They're sitting on these guys' legs. And the one guy grabs a woman's breast. And that's when the picture is taken. And I just think it's so sad because it's always like when they almost get something good, events would transpire to kind of somehow tarnish it for them. It's really sad. So thanks, Mark. So here's Denver's Blue Rope. So um, these would be crimps. I was so excited when I found this picture. Nobody else probably would be. It looks like nothing, but I'm like, it's the Blue Rope because all this stuff got demolished over the years because when women came in, the railroads brought them in, the proper women, the wives, all of this, obviously they did not want the red light district flourishing. So of course they would um, put pressure to have some of these things cleared away. And then what didn't get cleared away through the passage of time got cleared away when Coors um, bid one in because that's right in the heart of the red light district. So they, they bulldozed a lot of the buildings and made parking lots. Awesome. <laughs> um, cosmetics and allure. Uh, there were even drugs in the cosmetics in those days. So belladonna was used for dilating pupils. So that would give, like in the parlor houses, the bedroom eyes. It would cause blindness if you used it too much, but um, 
I don't know. Um, arsenic wipers were used for pale complexions, again, a part of our house problem. Um, women often did not wear fancy dresses, but they wore the brothel gowns that we've seen, so they're like white lance of Austria gowns, so it's, I guess I would have gone for the makeup too. <laughs> Some medical matters. Estimates of venereal disease, known as being burned, um, was prevalent. Methods for treatment, mercury, and fat remedies. There were half-page spreads in the Rocky Mountain News and Denver Post for curing syphilis. I mean, in my modern eyes, I'm like, wow, these people were just off the charts. Here, cure syphilis, you know, type of thing. And you could have addresses, the whole nine yards. These people were not shy. Um, avoiding pregnancy, prostitutes did get pregnant. I mean, there's, it's just people think that they didn't, but they did. Um, but to avoid it, they would have douches with bicarbonate of soda or borax, or bichloride of mercury, potassium beatrate, alum or vinegar. Um, abortions um, were done by ergot, prussic acid, strychnine, oil of tansy. So, kind of rough stuff. Thanks. So how safe was it to visit a brothel if you were a gentleman out on the town? It would depend on what brothel you went into. The brothels in the 1800 block were pretty good. They were the parallel houses. Um, but as you went up a number, um, the quality went down. So there are some inherent problems. First of all, you were probably drunk on some of that horrible whiskey, so your wits weren't about you. But um, when you were in the women's room, there was such a thing called hook and ladder artists. And so what they would do is with the transoms above the door, they would take like a fishing rod thing and try to snag the guy's pants to get the wallet and the watches out. So the girl would like make sure they were in a you know, special place so they could kind of whip them out, then they'd whip them back in while they were busy. So the guy would just kind of notice his pants were on the floor, and of course the girl would be just as surprised as he was. Uh, panel men, that's like when you had rings coating. You could hollow out areas and uh, the countless could sit there and behind the panel and when everybody got busy, crawl on out and like get watches and wallets. Creepers were considered the most talented of the thieves. They would actually creep into the room along the floor while people were busy. And light-fingered girls, so you know, drunks will be rolled type of thing, so. So this is Annie Ryan and her family. This is what my book is about. Um, it's a fictionalized account of a real madam and her family. Um, once again, these are not small women. Um, you know, um, this is a, um, Jane Elizabeth Ryan. She started off as a procurist. Annie at the far side there is the main character of my book. Um, this was a family-run business. So Annie um, started running her own nieces, and the boys of the family ran saloons and were procurers. So this was entirely a family-run business. It all was on Market Street. They had about three saloons, um, brothels, and various cribs. And so they were kind of considered the underworld royalty of Market Street, if that's the right term. I don't really know what it is. So next. Here's some pictures. The Monte Carlo is one of their saloons. Um, Jim Ryan is this big fat guy in the middle there. So, uh, which is why the family was reluctant to tell me some of the stories of prostitution and of this family's history, was because it does turn out when the depression came and they had large um, families, if they didn't have enough money for food, they would send the children around to the brothels or the saloons to get food because, as they said, there's always money for everything in a whorehouse. So Annie kept a lot of people alive during very lean years. And so that's why some people were so um, loyal to her. Because she really did help. But as you can see, this guy is not going to waste away and neither of the women, none of the women were either. So next. Um, this is a picture um, attributed to Denver. I think they're getting ready to celebrate Chinese New Year, but it is um, an opium den. So there, I've seen numbers between six and 17 opium dens, right between um, Market Street and Wazi and the alleyways downtown. So there you go. 
Here's Hot Valley in 1920. Um, obviously, opium was illegal at this point. I'm not really sure what's going on, and there's a policeman at the door, so I don't know if that's just some leftover bad behavior. Here's a saloon girl. Now, saloon girls are kind of more fun because they have like the plumes and you have the fancy dress, which I really wanted the prostitutes to have when I was writing the book. Uh, these people would have, these ladies would have taken it very poorly if you suggested that their morals were not on the up and up. However, it was a slippery slope between being a saloon girl and a full-fledged um, prostitute because you would be dancing with guys for 10 cents a dance. Uh, you'd be selling them beer and whiskey, and you'd get 20% of the selling price for that. And then you got to know, when you, you know, as we look at the odds for like men to women, they had to be propositioned. And if they didn't make enough money, did they have back um, back door trysts? Probably. Here's uh, Myers a Myers Avenue in Cripple Creek. That's their red light district. And there's a great museum called the Homestead House if you're ever in Cripple Creek. It is a museum. Um, they managed to set it up how it was when it was a brothel because this old lady from town came and helped them do it. And they're like, who are you? And it turns out she had been one of the girls who had worked there like years before. <laughs> Next. This is Leadville State Street. Most of it burned down in a fire in the 1950s, but there are still a few buildings like the Pioneer, which is down at the end. So you can see some of the traces. Um, at the end of the era, um, Food and Drug Act of 1906 enforced the labeling of medicinal ingredients. Um, so they, at this point, they were understanding the morphine, um, heroin, were addictive. I mean, they honestly probably didn't know that much before. Um, the Narcotics Tax Act restricted manufacture and distribution of the opiates, including laudanum and coca, which is cocaine. Um, 1915, Market Street closed down, as did Hop Alley. In 1918, all 48 states had laws against prostitution, making it illegal. Um, Nevada always had counties that remained wide open, but they're kind of an anomaly. And I think that's about the end of my presentation, unless you all have questions. <laughs> There's a question. I bring it to you, so I'll yell it out after you tell me what the question is. No, I think actually Nevada is still, um, partially there's still the structure where there's only counties where, certain counties where it is legal, so I don't think it's legal still in the whole state. Um, I think Parham um, is where they have like their chicken ranches. And I was staying in Virginia City and there was some woman who lived down like this alleyway and they're like, oh yeah, what's her name, lives there and she's a prostitute. And I'm like, wow, it's a real prostitute. I was fascinated. <laughs> Yes? There's a sign on Market Street somewhere, I think it's in 1715, that tells about the building that was on the So, 1942 Market Street, um, Lodos is on one side, but it is the House of Mirrors, which Jenny Rogers and Manny Silks and various other madams owned at one time or another. If you ask nicely to the people behind the bar, you can still go upstairs. And um, what's great about that one is A, that it remains, but B, it has bases in the use of standstone that have been carved out. And the story behind that, let me just tell you the story. Let's see how much time do I have. Uh, okay. So the story behind that is the first woman who started what we would know as a brothel in Denver was named Ada Lamott. And she was married to a minister, and they were coming out from Missouri, and she was like 19 years old. And so what happened is they're on a wagon train, they're headed towards Denver, and all of a sudden her husband goes missing along with a woman with loose morals. So they stop the wagon train, and they're like, oh my god, Indians might have gotten them something. And if that wasn't what happened, um, probably, but they disappeared. So Ada got mad, you know, and she, they all rumble into Denver. I'm sure it was a very unhappy trip for her. 
she gets to Denver, casts aside the canvas tent in the wagon and says, an honest woman, you see me for the last time. From here on, I'm opening up a brothel. And she did. So she did that. She built the original building, and then comes along Jenny Rogers, who buys the building from her, and she's like, I want a fancier brothel. But she didn't have the money. And she had the taste, but not the money. So if you think madams were really confidential women who would keep their clientele secret, forget that. She went through her black book and figured out her wealthiest patrons, and she's like, you're going to help me build this brothel. I need X amount of dollars. And if they didn't pay, help her pay for it, she had their likeness carved and put in the eaves on the, on the outside. So when Denver was a small town and they'd know who the wealthy people were, they'd be writing by going, hey, I didn't know Joe was one of Jenny's clients, but Joe didn't succumb to the blackmail. So that's, that's the story, and you can still see it. It's a historic landmark with the sign, so thank you for bringing that up. Still there, um, it's a great story, and um, these women just, they were business women. So, you know, it's kind of like if people didn't want to play along. Um, the reason why this was all allowed to happen is the madams and the prostitutes and the saloons had to pay license fees. And the license fees went directly into people's pockets or into City Hall, which enabled this whole structure to happen where City Hall really wanted Vice to prosper because that's where they got all their money from. So, yeah. Um, you would look it up by Lodos um, is the restaurant name, but it's called the House of Mirrors, and it's on 1942 Market Street. So um, I just in our book club move over just laudanum in in the book. I can't remember the book right now, but I've never heard of that term before. And and this young woman, this is a young girl's boyfriend, died of that. Right. And so overdose. From that. Oh, she she died, and he he overdosed on purpose next to her grave. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what she was saying in a book she read, um, a young man, a young man's girlfriend was addicted to laudanum. No, no, no. She died. She and died, he and he overdosed on laudanum. Okay. So um, my great aunt uh, lived in Golden as well, and she is related to Lydia in my book, who is a real estate agent. And we were driving by this house, and she's like, yeah, my mom used to own that house. We lived there for a while. It was a nice house. And she's like, well, she was a laudanum addict. And I'm like, never tell that to 10-year-olds, because they may remember. I'm like, laudanum addict? I'm like, what's that? And then she's like, it's a drug. And I'm like, well, what did she do? Because I was going to think it was going to be really wild. And she's like, she slept a lot. <laughs> and I thought that was so boring. But um, what is interesting to see, a lot of people did become addicted to laudanum. I can see how her disease was based on where she was living in certain years. So, um, you know, when she was doing well in business, she had her addiction under control. She would live in very, very nice houses. Um, when things were going poorly, she would live up in a small house in Georgetown. You know, so you can kind of see how the addiction had been flowed by residences. Where is Cripple Creek? Cripple Creek is west of um, Colorado Springs, west of Manitou Springs, so okay. definitely worth a visit. Yeah? Um, do you know anything about Brooklyn? Brooklyn, um, yeah, so a friend of mine, Laurel Watson, wrote, wrote a book, um, Sin Circuit of Yampa, Yampa Sin Circuit, yeah, this is nodding. She's great, and so um, Steve Out Springs had Brooklyn. I guess it's across the bridge. Um, and so when I was looking for prostitution in this area, I kept reading stuff about the Brooklyn Bridge. And I'm like, why was Steve Out so interested in Brooklyn? And why are they talking about the Brooklyn Bridge? And that's because that was the district where they had saloons, because I think Steve Out was probably a pretty dry town. And all their mayhem was going on over there. Um, I would say a lot of their prostitutes came in with the railroads because you do have a lot of railroads through here. So yeah, so it's just kind of funny to read some of that because I was just like, I'm like, Steamboat Springs is obsessed with Brooklyn. I just don't get it. And then Laura got sorted out. She's like, that's all that's my best friend. And then in Oak Creek, their, their prostitutes were even a little bit lower level. Yeah, they were going down there earlier. Yeah. Yeah. 
ever look at obituaries uh, cause of death Rocky Mountain Fever? Cause of death Rocky Mountain Fever? I have not seen that. I do look at obituaries. Um, is that syphilis? Syphilis. Yeah, I think somebody else told me that too. But you know, what's you know, there is like Rocky Mountain spotted fever yeah. from ticks. So oh. <laughs> I don't know when they figured that all out, but uh, yeah. Any other questions? So okay. Well, um, there are let's see. There's books for sale in the back if you're interested. There are also um, bookmarkers and little swag pieces about reviews on the book. And um, thank you very much for being such a good audience.